Mike Calvin is currently an owner of Focused Leadership Solutions, a consulting group that assists schools and districts in their long-range improvement efforts. Before joining this organization, Mike served as a principal of Columbine Elementary School, a national school of character where he led systemic change initiatives in the areas of academics, special education, and personal and social responsibility. He currently serves as a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel for the Character Education Partnership in Washington, D.C. Please help me welcome Mike Calvin. Um, If we're going to build something, if we're going to build a new culture, we have to have tools that work. We have to have tools that match the task. And any craftsperson will tell you we have to have the right tool for the right job. Be talking about human-centered tools tonight. Schools are deeply human institutions. And if we're going to ask them to do things differently, we need to provide a model for them. We need to provide them with tools that are human-centered, not law-based or uh, based on somebody's whim of what might be best politically. One of the first tools I learned about, I learned from a very unlikely teacher. His name was Michael. He was about this tall. He was in third grade. Um, He had hair that stuck out to here. Uh, His glasses were held together by large amounts of duct tape and scotch tape. If you can get an idea of what this student looked like, he looked like a little miniature version of a mad scientist. And he was in the middle of everything. So much energy. And I met Michael uh, the first day uh, of my job as a new principal. And I probably had a little bit of a of a, an overinflated idea of my abilities, not to speak of the authority that I thought came along with this job. And uh, Michael came into my office probably 10 minutes after he arrived at school the first day for some infraction of the rules on the playground. He was sent in to talk with me. I talked with him. I thought I did a pretty good job. Sent him back out on the playground. Came to work the next day and he was sent in again before school. And this time I talked to him a little bit longer and probably emphasized my authority a little bit more. Talked with him as the principal, as what he needed to do to uh, uh, change his behavior and keep from getting sent in again. Day three, you can probably see it coming. I came to school a little bit late. I was at a meeting off-site and I came into the office and there was Michael sitting on a chair, arms crossed, looking around the office, kind of like he owned the place, swinging his legs, not a care in the world. And I got a little bit impatient. I thought, you know, he's taking up my time. This is, I, I have valuable things that I should be doing. And why isn't this child paying attention to what I'm telling him? So I bent over, put my hand on his shoulder. I said, come on into my office. We went into the inner principal's office. And uh, I got down real close to him and I said, Michael, tell me what happened. Well, to make his long story short, he basically said, my friends made me do it. And uh, thinking I was really original, I said, well, Michael, now look what's happened. Your friends are out on the playground and you're here in the principal's office. And he looked around and he said, this is the principal's office? (laughs) And even worse, then he looked directly at me and he said, you're the principal? (laughs) I said yes, and I was thoroughly chastened, and I realized that that in that particular situation, using my authority with Michael was not using the right tool for the right job. I was using my authority, and probably you use your authority, you can get people to comply, you can get compliance, but I'm not sure if you can get commitment when you're asking people to change their behavior or their their values, values or the way they do things. So the lesson that Michael taught me was um, if you want to help people change a little bit, maybe see them do things a little bit differently, it's probably not best to rely on your authority to inspire them. It's probably better to come up with another tool because your authority is not the right tool for the right job. And uh, I did work with Michael over the next couple of years and he did learn how to change his behavior but it only happened after we built a relationship with each other and we actually knew each other and Michael uh, 
could talk with me and understand where I was coming from and, and for me the same thing with him. Michael Fullen, who does all kinds of work with school reform, I know you've heard his name, says that building relationships is the very m most powerful tool that you can use in changing a school. If you want to change a school, change the quality of relationships between the adults in the school and the adults and the kids. That's the right tool for the right job. Michael was lucky that he went to a school, he went to Columbine Elementary School, which was a, a school in the small town of Woodland Park, which is up in the mountains outside of Colorado Springs. And he was lucky because Columbine uh, used what's probably, in my opinion, the most powerful tool that exists for building a culture of reflection and learning, and that tool is a growth mindset. Carol Dweck uh, is a professor at Stanford University, and she's done pioneering work around mindsets. And she talks about mindsets as being the filter or the framework for the way that people see uh, the, the causes of success and non-success or failure. Dr. Dweck says that people tend to adopt one of two different mindsets, either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Under a fixed mindset, people tend to think that uh, the attributes of success or the reasons for success lie outside of the person. They might have to do with your demographic group that you're in, your gender, your uh, uh, economic status, maybe your IQ as, as measured by a test, uh, your special education status. Those are attributes of a fixed mindset and your success or failure will be dependent on those factors. Folks who have a growth mindset tend to think that your success is based on uh, things that are intrinsic to you and that have to do with your uh, ability to work hard at something. That uh, intelligence can be increased through practice and hard work. That you can achieve goals. Sometimes your goals might be achieved after multiple failures and that practice makes perfect. So I think to sum it up, Carol Dweck would say that a growth mindset depends a lot on our own effort and about knowing what we need to do to get better. So Columbine Elementary School really did have an emphasis on a growth mindset and that helped Michael immeasurably over the years. One way that that played out at Columbine was uh, in the area of personal, uh, what they called personal and social responsibility. They identified seven areas that they thought uh, their students should be proficient in that didn't have to do with academics, they had to do with character, specifically performance character. What are attributes that affect your ability to be successful in life? And they identified things like taking responsibility for your behavior, taking risks, accepting challenges, uh, working well with others. And I don't have a lot of slides here, but I do want to show you a couple. This was uh, the tear sheet that they passed out to parents and it was a long list. It had all seven uh, personal and social responsibility standards and they broke those standards down into specific behaviors. And they put them on a rubric that was written in kid-friendly language and it was divided into four uh, levels of performance so that uh, kids were, uh, well, I'll show you. Now, I'm not going to tell you to cover your left eye and, and point which way the E goes. I know you can't see the smaller things here, it's not a test, but you can see kind of the framework. So up on the top, takes risks and accepts challenges. You can see the four areas over on the left, it's marked partially proficient, and it says in progress basic, and then on the right is proficient and advanced. And they would take these character traits, break them down into behaviors, and let me read one across for you. Um, I often get frustrated right away and give up. I don't try to do the activity at all. I often daydream or just don't do the work I am supposed to do. That's in progress. A basic proficiency in, in taking risks, accepting challenges would be, I try not to give up, but many times I do. I need lots of encouragement and help. I occasionally become frustrated. This is proficient. I occasionally become frustrated when attempting a task, but I still try to do the task. And finally, an advanced student might say, I accept challenges, I don't become frustrated, I keep on trying until I succeed. 
Now Columbine developed this language, but they also, they taught the language directly to the children. They taught to the children how to self-assess and they taught them how to set goals for moving themselves from one stage to the next. Now think about that a little bit in terms of a growth mindset. This really puts your own behavior under your control. Not only that you know what the expectations are, but you know what you need to do to get better. This came out of the teachers at Columbine looking at their uh, citizenship section on the report card that just had the old outstanding, good, satisfactory, unsatisfactory. The teacher said that's really an attribute of a fixed mindset. That, that reflects a fixed mindset. We don't tell kids what they need to do to grow and to get better. So this was a, uh, what I thought was a really great example of a growth mindset. And something like this, this exact tool actually helped Michael as he improved over the years. And when I take this concept and apply it to school improvement or to the whole school getting better, I think a lot of times schools don't actually know what they need to do to move to the next step. They need a little bit of coaching and they need a little bit of help. And uh, it's important for us to provide that for them. Another thing that, uh, another way that Columbine used this uh, rubric was to work with kids specifically and connect their needs, their learning needs, when they uh, identified their, uh, what they needed to do to master a specific skill, they tied it in with the, the personal and social re responsibility standards. So that, uh, for example, Bill Miller, who was a third grade resource teacher at the time, I watched Bill as he sat with every one of his third graders who had been designated with special needs, he was, his goal was to get all of those kids proficient in reading. And he worked through uh, the reading skills with the kids and the kids knew exactly what they needed to do to get better. He didn't stop there, he used this rubric to talk with them about what did they need to do in the area of taking risks, accepting challenges, where were they, what did they need to do to get better. And this was a tough, uh, it's a tough thing for some, a teacher to do. It demands a lot of courage because it's hard to tell a third grader that you're not doing as well in reading as you're expected to. And Bill did it in a very kindly and gentle way, but the kids had an honest appraisal of where they were. He didn't tell the kids, good job, way to go, you know, you're a great reader. First of all, the kids knew that they weren't if they were seeing him. It wasn't honest to talk about what Jeff said earlier. Maybe you want to give them hope, but by not being honest, that does not really give them hope. So Bill was honest with them, and you could talk with a kid in, at that school, and they would say, well, I'm in third grade, but I'm really only reading at the first grade level, and I need to do this and this and this to get better. And I'll do that by you know, taking risks. I need to guess more when I don't know the answer. They really played it out. And that spring, uh, the third graders, that Bill worked with the third grade at that school, 86 out of the 88 kids scored proficient on the CSAP test in reading. And I attribute it directly to the work that, that Bill did. Uh, the, we know that uh, if you've read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he talks about facing the brutal facts. And I think that's uh, a good term for what children need to do. It's very difficult to tell a 10th grader with special needs that you might have to work harder your whole life to keep up with the people around you. But it's honest, that's what gives people hope. The fact that they have a goal that they think they can achieve and they're supported. And that's what helps schools get better too. And I watched a, uh, a, a school in South Dakota, a very small school, examine the, the uh, brutal facts of their situation. They were put on a failing schools list in South Dakota and the teachers were just humiliated, embarrassed and ashamed. They worked together to figure out what happened. They realized that they hadn't put the work into teaching mathematics. They were on the list because of low achievement in mathematics. They realized what they had done. They were not spending the time they needed to teaching math. So they used another tool, right tool for the right job. They developed what we called a shared agreement. And it, they just agreed that we'll work an hour and 15 minutes a day on mathematics, every single one of us. Well, after my colleague and I developed that shared agreement with him, we went back to Denver and I got a phone call the next week and it was Kathy who's the lead teacher at, 
at, at that little school, Yost Elementary, and she said, Mike, there, we have a teacher who's not following the shared agreement. And I said, well, how do you know? Well, I had an open school. They could see into all of the classrooms. And they said, she's spending all morning on her Disney on Ice unit, just like she used to. And she's not teaching mathematics the way she promised. And I said, well, you know, how can I help you? And she thought for a minute, and she was 800 miles away, and she said, well, maybe we need to work on that at RN. And uh, I went back next month, and they had developed a system in their data meeting where every teacher went around the circle and they committed to, they told that they had followed the shared agreements for the last month. Each teacher had to be publicly accountable for following those. And every one of them did. And to me, that is a culture of reflection and learning because the teachers at that school identified their challenge and they came up with a solution to monitor themselves. They didn't have to have someone coming in and holding out a, uh, a carrot in front of them or having a stick behind them. They agreed on what they needed to do to solve the problem and they moved forward and did it. A very exciting thing to see when that happens in a school. Uh, these human-centered tools that involve collaboration, they are, involve building an identi identity around the mission that you have, the moral purpose you have for being a teacher, really talking with your colleagues about that, generating a free flow of information in your school, improving the relationships. I call those human-centered tools, and I think they're the right tools for the right job. But I challenge you as educators to think about what's going on out there in the world of sort of school reform. And these tools aren't really being used. We have policy tools, we have structural tools, we have laws that give us carrots and sticks to punish us or to reward us for doing what's called the right thing, when really we have a set of tools that could be uh, very effective if we use them in, in the work that we do. So I would, I would just say that, and not to give you advice, but you haven't asked me for any, but I will give you a little bit. If you're involved in any kind of school leadership, to me, whether it's teacher, teacher leaders, building principals, uh, if you're a district leader, if you're a parent, if you're on the uh, parent committee or you're on the school board, really think about these tools that help people develop their ability to work together as human beings. And uh, I think that they're effective tools. Uh, I'd like to see more people give these tools a chance because to me they really are the right tools for the right job. Thank you.